Hello, hello. I'm your host, Mike. Welcome back to another episode of The Reading Rookie. 98.7 The Page. <laughs> you know, we're only on episode two, but I feel like down the line, this is going to be my favorite part of each episode. I mean, I feel like my voice will just get deeper and deeper every time I just keep saying The Reading Rookie. Yeah, it's not corpse level deep, but no, no. <laughs> I just like the sound of it. It's funny to me. Anyways, how's it going, everyone? It took us a while to get back here. Almost five months since the first episode where we talked about the ferret man and his incredible story. And what's really cool is that he actually listened to it. Charles Hamilton watched my video, or actually listened to my video, left a comment, and even shared it on his Facebook page. So. Yeah, that was pretty cool of him. I just hope that he didn't watch it when YouTube decided to add or like spam 50 extra ads to that video. I swear, I was playing Ghost of Tsushima one day and my um my cousin just texted me. I was like, yo, what's up with this video? I get like an ad every five minutes. And I had to go check to see if he was lying or not. And apparently, yeah, every five minutes, there was just an ad that would just pop up during my discussion of... uh. Uh, before before our adventures and it, just, it it was just annoying I guess like so Charles if you're listening if that was your first impression of the video I am so sorry it's fixed now but back then I I just felt like an idiot also uh yeah I decided to also spruce up this virtual room and add a picture frame just to make these episodes a little a little more a little more special for each read. Here we have, um, uh, who did I put? Carl Weezer from Jimmy Neutron. And I promise you, it is not, it is not random. It will make perfect sense in context with today's book. The Courage to be Disliked, written by Fumitake Koga and Ichido Kishimi, who's very influenced by Adler's individual psychology. I didn't know how popular this book was in Japan until after reading. I picked it up during my vacation in Portland, liking how the entire discussion is just a conversation between these two characters. Here, on the one side, you have the philosopher who's wise and ascended to this higher level of understanding about the world. And then we have the student, the youth, however you want to picture him. And he's pretty, and he pretty much represents us, the reader, with a very cynical view of the world and lives a very restricting life. In five nights, this cynic listens to the philosopher in the hopes of understanding what it takes to live a happy life. Forewarning, I will not cover everything, but just the core ideas and my thoughts on them. And if I could just advise you all who are listening, these thoughts are very subjective. There are some things that I love about this book and other things that can't be applied so easily. I want to remind you that these are not stone cold facts and the examples provided sometimes don't cover a lot of ground but as we go along i'll get into the specifics for each one for each one of these nights all right i think that was enough of an introduction who's ready to think positive let's begin So I'm just going to combine the introduction and first night together because this intro is pretty short and it just paints the premise of this narrative. Philosopher is considered to hold all the answers to life and happiness and this young man who sees the world as this, as this chaotic mess of contradictions challenges the philosopher to prove him wrong and make him a believer that the solutions to life are simple. I'm also going to change the name of youth. Philosopher sounds okay, but there's just something about youth that doesn't roll off the tongue naturally to me. So for the remainder of this review, we're going to give him a different name. So, Carl, all right? That's a simple name. And another thing I'd like to note, there's actual, I was surprised by this, there's actual world building in this. It's not the strongest, but there are glimpses of the world around them during their conversations. For instance, in this universe, religion is just gone. Okay, Carl starts talking like they're living in desperate times, saying that without religion to rely on, people are just filled with anxiety and doubt. To me, this <laughs> this sounds like a fantasy because I can't see a point in time where religion would ever be obsolete. Personally, I'm not a believer myself, 
but it serves its purpose to ease a person's mind, and that's a quality I don't think could ever die down. But that's just the purpose for this specific world, to make the philosopher's way of living like the last remaining option. He tells Carl that the world itself isn't complicated, but Carl himself makes it complicated because we live in the subjective world that we ourselves give meaning to. And he describes this using a strong example of water from a well. Apparently, I didn't even know this, well water stays the same temperature all year round, always 60 degrees. Never changes, right? Now, let's say you had a friend who drank this water, said it was the most refreshing drink he's ever had in his life, better than sex. So you seek out this well water, and when you take a sip, it's all warm and hot and gross, giving you a very bad experience. And all you want to do now is chew your friend out for lying to you. But your friend wasn't lying about his experience, and neither were you. The water doesn't change, but depending on whether you drink it in the summer or winter, creates two different experiences. So it's not that the world is cruel or unfair, but we see it as such based on our past experiences. And by exposing the viewpoint, the philosopher gives us this opportunity to change how we see the world. But Carl isn't convinced, and that's another main highlight from the book. It isn't like most self-help books where one person is just handing all this life advice and saying, it just works, take it. There are, there are actual back and forth arguments to explore all aspects of the advice and get you thinking, which I like a lot. My main criticism though is that the examples are limited to specific scenarios and the philosopher carries this stubborn attitude that treats his ideals as absolute and doesn't allow wiggle room. I mean the major claim he makes for this first night is that he denies trauma, saying that doesn't exist. And I bet at this point most of you just stopped listening and left. <laughs> because that's what happened. This one claim was a major turnoff for many readers as it didn't resonate well with their own experiences. And the example given is so simplistic for such a thought. Carl has this friend, let's call him Jimmy, who's a recluse. He's always locked up in his lab, you know, making experiments and gadgets because he had enough of the kids at school bullying him about his hair and wants to spend no more time with his dog, Goddard. From this example, you would say that because of his past, Jimmy doesn't want to leave his house anymore. But the philosopher goes against this cause and effect approach and looks at the scenario with teleology, which is the study of the purpose of a given phenomenon, rather than its causes. So instead of thinking that Jimmy won't leave because of the trauma he experienced at school, Adler will want you to think that Jimmy secretly wants to stay in his lab and uses the trauma of his past as an excuse not to change. I mean, it does sound possible for a certain amount of people, but I'm still not convinced. When I first read about his stance on denying trauma, my mind went immediately to like PTSD with war veterans or victims of abuse. Am I just supposed to accept that their trauma doesn't exist? or that they are willingly choosing to use it as an excuse not to change? That just seems very insensitive, which Carl does point out time and time again. This is the first major principle and I don't think I could ever accept it, mainly because the examples aren't doing a good job explaining all aspects of trauma, just the small ones. Carl uses a different example to explore this idea further, talking about this one time a waitress spilled coffee on him, causing him to scream at her and saying that he couldn't control himself. By that logic, the philosopher gives Carl a knife in this scenario, and when the waitress spills the coffee, Carl just couldn't control himself and stabbed her. Like, what? <laughs> Where did the knife come from? That's such an extreme argument to say that we actually do have some control over our emotions and have a choice on how to handle our past experiences. See, for that specific example, I can understand. At least the philosopher acknowledges that the pain and feelings we experience are real. It's how we handle it afterwards that it is in our power. But it's all subjective, depending on the person and the severity of the trauma. Sure, it's possible to change, but it depends on a certain trait to push through. And that is courage. For the record, this is exactly how my mind and emotions process all these discussions when I first read it. Get used to this pattern of being introduced to a mind-blowing concept and debating until you get to the big realization at the end. You get one of those for every night. 
The second half of this night isn't as shocking as denying trauma, and this should be relatable to most, if not all of us, at some point of our lives. Carl starts the conversation off talking about his more upbeat, energetic friend, who we shall call Sheen. Now, Sheen is a pretty likable guy. He has a sweet Ultra Lord collection. Naturally, a lot of people like to be around Sheen. And Carl wishes he could be more like him, thinking that if Sheen's life looks happy, Carl could be happy too. But quickly denies the possibility because their personalities are so different from each other. The philosopher has other ideas though. He tells Carl that the reason for his desire to become Sheen is because he doesn't love himself and thinks that becoming someone else will help him love himself. But that's just not possible, no matter how many times he wishes it. Sheen is Sheen, Carl's Carl, and you are you. The philosopher says it's okay to be you and if you aren't feeling happy now, you yourself have to take the first step forward and focus on the things you have instead of what you don't. And then he points the finger at Carl saying that he chose to be unhappy. In other words, we choose to be unhappy. We choose not to change either. In Adler psychology, our personalities are tied with our lifestyles and we tend to treat our lifestyles as personalities, something that we consider to be innate or unchangeable. So that could be a start to making that first step forward. So for instance, instead of saying, I am a pessimist, it's more accurate to say, I have a pessimistic view of the world. And suddenly it sounds like the latter has the potential to be changed. But that's only if you have what it takes to change it. Another good point the philosopher has us consider is that we choose not to change our lifestyles because it's familiar. You know the routines in your day, how to respond to people and their actions, and it just seems easier to leave things as they are. Whereas pursuing a new lifestyle is very unpredictable, and you have no idea where it could lead, making the journey quite scary. Which is why he pushes the importance of courage. The courage to take the next step forward. That's what's ultimately holding us back. Not our past or upbringings, but just the lack of courage. So here we are in the second night. Carl had a week to ponder over their last discussion and tried to find some strong points about himself, but failed and admitted that he really doesn't like who he is. He's big, very round, got a nasal wheeze, and has an obsession with llamas that no one else could relate to. There's just not a lot to instill some confidence in him, and he's very self-conscious about how other people see him. The philosopher finds the answer simple and uses an example to explain it. A couple years ago, when he used to do counseling sessions, there was a female student, we'll call her Cindy, who came to him about the fear of blushing. She was tired of getting so red in public and hoped the philosopher could cure her so maybe she could make some new friends or ask out her crush, Chip. The philosopher did not help her, saying that the problem wasn't her blushing, but the possibility of being rejected. Because say he did take away her fear, what would that leave her with? The possibility of rejection. He speculated that she was using her fear of blushing as an excuse, something to blame if she was rejected. Her line of thinking would be, I could do this if it wasn't for my fear of blushing. And this kind of thinking is pretty common, I would say. Man, life would be so much better if I just won the lottery. I could be so much happier if it wasn't for such and such. Going back to Carl, the philosopher tells him that he's only focused on his weaknesses to avoid his fear of being disliked, and avoids interpersonal relationships altogether, leading into the next major claim, all problems are interpersonal relationship problems. Life would be so much easy if there weren't other people around, but that's impossible. And saying that all our problems are tied to other people is an extreme position to hold. Carl can't believe it, so the philosopher explains this by discussing the feeling of inferiority, which should sound familiar to all of us. The philosopher uses his height for an example, supposedly being 5 feet tall, I didn't know he was like, you know, almost dwarf size, but now some people would just look at the disadvantages of being short, like not being able to reach high places or holding some image of being strong and intimidating. But instead of focusing on what he doesn't have, 
The philosopher instead chooses to focus on the advantages, such as making people feel more relaxed because he isn't that big and tall. Similar to the well water example, these feelings of inferiority are subjective and depend on how you value yourself. It also shouldn't be seen as something negative. When you have a feeling of inferiority, you're aware of your weaknesses but you view them as a motive to change and grow. It supports the mentality, I'm not smart, so I should try harder. The thing you should be worried about is developing an inferiority complex which the philosopher sees as another excuse to stump your efforts to grow. It shouldn't be lumped with the feeling of inferiority as it supports the mentality, I'm not smart, therefore I cannot succeed. There's just no room for growth with inferiority complex. For the most part, I was liking this part of the discussion specifically about how he goes into more details to accept yourself, faults and all. But then he takes the conversation far enough to talk about this form of superiority complex which is bragging about one's own misfortunes. Here the philosopher is making the claim that people make themselves special by their experience with misfortune in order to place themselves above others. The example he uses is someone who's acting pretty angst with the mentality of you don't understand how I feel and then slams the door and proceeds to fall asleep with Linkin Park playing in the background. I mean those kind of people aren't uncommon but I don't think they do it with some conscious agenda to hold power over others. I think they're just legit sad and need ways to express themselves. Again my main problem is how the philosopher just claims these ideas with absolute certainty. There's just no room for variability that comes off as a little biased and it irritates me sometimes reading it. But moving on we get to the next topic of discussion which is probably one of my favorites as the philosopher discusses our instinct to view life as a competition. No matter where we look there's always going to be someone above or beneath us in terms of skills, beauty, etc etc. And that sucks us into this bad habit of always comparing ourselves to others. The book presented this in a way that I honestly thought was scary. The idea that from now until the day you die, you could always be living in competition with others. If you see yourself as a loser, you'll always seek to win. And if you see yourself as a winner, you'll always have to stay on top to avoid being a loser. There just doesn't seem to be any breaks with this viewpoint so I appreciate the philosopher's approach with positive thinking. Instead of imagining the world composed of people in competition with each other, imagine everyone just trying to move forward towards the goal of achieving happiness for their own lives. Instead of seeing everyone around you as an enemy, see them as comrades who are trying to work on themselves as well because that way you could also eliminate the self-conscious thought that everyone is looking at you, which isn't true. Everyone's way too worried about themselves to be paying attention to you and unless it's painfully obvious that someone's out to get you, you shouldn't let that constrain your life. Carl can't believe it. He reveals a little more about his childhood, about having been raised by strict parents and was always being compared to his more obedient older brother. The philosopher sees the problem, as I'm sure we all do, but that's better discussed the next night. So for now we can set it up with the discussion of our life tasks. They are tied to our interpersonal relationships and there are three things to consider them with. Your work life, your love life, and your friendships. I'm not going to go into full detail but quick summaries to describe each one. Work tasks basically say that there is no work that can be completed by yourself. Even if the people you work with are assholes and don't get along with you, the common objective is still completing some sort of work. So it's important to remember what the ultimate goal is at the end. For friendship tasks, the distance and depth is what's important. Some people have a tendency to carry this worry about not having enough friends in their lives but the number doesn't increase how valuable the relationship is. And with love tasks, which are much more difficult since the relationship is deeper, one thing to keep in mind is that you shouldn't run away. Not from the relationship itself but not avoiding choices relating to the relationship. If the relationship isn't working out, don't delay and make the choice of either fixing it or ending it. If the connection is feeling repressive or restrictive, talk it out or move on. The worst thing you could do for yourself is to just sit there and do nothing, letting the problems fester like a fungus. 
At some point, something has to change. A choice is going to be made regardless. And the quicker you do it, the less painful it will be. And all it takes is, again, a little courage. We arrive at the third night, which is what I believe to be the peak of this book because of this one question. What would you say is the definition of freedom? The philosopher asked this question to Carl to think about and he didn't have an answer, but wanted to address the phrase, money is coined freedom. Now, I'm sure we all heard about the idea that money can buy you happiness and freedom, but is the solution so simple as to just buy your way to it? Your financial problems will be solved, yes, but what remains? Your interpersonal relationships. And that leads Carl to go into a bit of a rant talking about the bonds you share with people saying that while it would be nice to free yourself from certain people and their bullshit, it's just not that easy. You can't exactly break your bonds with a boss you don't like or parents who seem very controlling in your life. So how? How do you deal with it? Well, one must not try to seek recognition. Pulled straight from the teachings of Judaism, if you are not living your life for yourself, then who is going to live it for you? It's not uncommon to say that in some shape or form we, base, we live based on someone else's expectations. And it's not always a bad thing. Our identities are shaped because of other people, so they play a huge role for our present day selves. But there should be a point where one should stop relying on the expectation of others and become more confident with themselves and their actions. And if it helps, consider this thought. If you aren't living to satisfy other people's expectations, then the same should be true that other people are not living for your expectations. I'm sure at some point in our lives we came across someone who just didn't act the way we, we wanted them to. Maybe a family member who's a little too vulgar or, or a friend who talks more than they should. But that isn't something to get angry or disappointed about because they don't live for you. And I can imagine how frustrating it would be for someone who's always living to please someone else's expectations not get the same treatment in return. And it just sounds unfair. Of course, Carl can't accept this, saying that a relationship through mutual recognition is what society is built on. For instance, how else could a person succeed if he isn't climbing the social ladder towards a comfortable lifestyle? The philosopher responds by highlighting the means towards that quote-unquote happy ending. If reaching that comfortable lifestyle means having to fulfill other people's expectations, then that journey is going to be very rough because you will always be worrying about how other people look at you and your life and everything you do will be based on their judgment. The solution to this is a term known as the separation of tasks. It's treated like a difficult idea to grasp and could damage your current relationships if you don't fully understand how it works. So if you're interested, look it up yourselves for a better understanding but you could probably get a clue of what it means exactly. Think about the relationship between the therapist and his or her client. A therapist can't magically change your life for the better. A therapist is there to support you through your troubles, provide you with the tools and advice to surpass those troubles, and encourage you to apply those tools to your everyday life. As a therapist, that is their task. The client's task would be to decide whether or not to accept these tools and make the attempt to change his or her life. As the old saying goes, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Actually, I'll use an example from my own life that might be more relatable. Now, I just discovered that there's someone out there who dislikes my videos without even watching. I call him in the act while fixing up the end screen for my recent video on holes. That video went public for two minutes and already there was dislike, so I knew right off the bat that this person didn't bother watching. Or maybe they did and just automatically declared it bad from the start. Now, if I was as self-conscious as I was in the past, I would have probably placed a lot of blame on myself wondering what I did wrong and making changes to myself and my style just to make that one dislike go away. At that point, I start treating this person's problems as my own, never knowing the reason why. I don't know who this person is or what his or her beef is with me and yet I would feel compelled to make sure that this other person is happy, aka living to satisfy this person's expectations. This is where the separation of tasks becomes important. For my fellow artists who aspire to excel as a writer, 
a content creator, entertainer, any sort of field that uses you or your ideas as a consumed good, drill it into your heads right now that not everyone is going to like you. And accepting that fact will only make your life so much better. If you're feeling judged or crave recognition from people, then that means that you haven't separated your task from others. How other people see you, how other people treat you, that's something that you have no control over. That's a fact. How you see others, how you treat others, that's something that no one else but you can have control over. The separation of tasks gets elaborated on a different night, so I'm just covering the initial idea of understanding whose tasks are whose. Speaking for myself, creating the videos and picking out what's discussed is my task. And how other people respond to the final product is their task. As long as I understand where the responsibility and emotions belong to, I won't be swayed by anyone's judgment anymore. This ultimately supports the philosopher's definition of freedom, which, funny enough, has been sitting in front of all our faces this entire time. It's the title of the book. Freedom is having the courage to be disliked. Quoted from the book, unless someone is unconcerned by other people's judgments, has no fear of being disliked by other people, and pays the cost that one might never be recognized, one will never be able to follow through in one's own way of living. Yet with my example, this is the case with a stranger, and Carl makes an incredibly good point about the people close to you, who are merely just concerned about your future. A parent who is directing you towards the right school, or friends who care enough to interfere and take control if they see you heading in the wrong direction. He didn't like the philosopher frowning upon the idea of someone planning their life out for you. And I wholeheartedly agree. It helps to get someone else's opinion from time to time, just as long as you're also okay with the idea too. This then becomes a choice. Does one choose a life of recognition from others, or does one choose a path of freedom without recognition? To follow a life of recognition means that you are freed from the stress of thinking about what to do with your life and you simply run through the rails gifted by your parents. And this kind of lifestyle also implies that you just don't want to be disliked and stay in the good graces of people around you. The real disadvantage would be constantly worrying about other people's expectations and trying to appeal to all of them just so you wouldn't be disliked, becoming an unfree way to live. It's not impossible to live without judgment, but don't go blaming others when you know full well that all the choices were yours. Personally, I believe in the balance between the two. The judgment of others gives me an idea on how to proceed forward, whether it be with my work or my friendships, but I never let it get to the point where it's controlling every little choice I make. I live for myself, not for others. Others live for themselves, not for me. Now I'm not here to tell you how to live your life. No one can live it aside from yourself and you yourself know what's best for you. I just want you to understand that you do have choices and it's something to consider if you feel like there's only one path to take. Stop living for others and try living for yourself. So who's ready to talk about selfishness? Now I'm sure this is a foreign concept to us all. If I know humans, we are the most generous, self-sacrificing bunch this galaxy has ever known. How did we get here? Well, Carl had some complaints about the separating of tasks, saying that it does a better job making us lonely than bringing us together. The way he sees it, each person is focused on their own tasks, living however they please and never interfering with one another. The philosopher clarifies that the separation of tasks shouldn't be seen as keeping people's lives and affairs apart, but just unraveling the threads and knowing whose problem belongs to who with the appropriate amount of distance. Also, this isn't the goal of interpersonal relationships, only a gateway. The goal is what is known as the feeling of community. And our definition of community isn't the same as Adler's definition of community. When you hear the word community, what do you think of? Probably home, school, work life, you know, the common stuff. Adler's community covers everything. I'm talking about the entire universe from plants to inanimate objects, even the entire axis of time from the past to the present. 
Community feeling, on the other hand, is much more acceptable and can also be referred to as social interest or interest to society, with the smallest unit of society being between two people, you and I. That's usually the starting point, and from there you can reach the feeling of community by making the switch from attachment to self to concern for others. In other words, making the switch from self-interest to social interest. We are selfish people. The philosopher ties self-centeredness with the desire to be recognized, saying that while it may seem that you are concerned about other people and their judgment, Really, you were just concerned about yourself, which is the drive for why you care so much about how others see you. Now, he isn't saying that it's wrong to be concerned about yourself. It's only bad when you take it too far that you end up thinking the world revolves around you. The main purpose for this night is to shape your view to see ourselves living with a community and being part of a whole, as opposed to seeing others as, oh, people who can do something for you. I really love the analogy he uses with geography here. Okay, so imagine being French. Unless you are French, unless I have some French viewers. So imagine being you, <laughs> and you look at the world map. America on the left, Asia on the right, and you're up in the very center. Makes you feel special. But if you were to look at a Chinese map, Europe will be on the left, removing you from being the center. Now, imagine the globe. No matter what spot you pick, that will always be the center. Every place will always feel central, meaning that every place and everyone has the same level of importance. See, the importance of Adler's community is to obtain a sense of belonging, that sense of, it's okay to be here. It shouldn't be what others can do for you, but what you can offer to others, making you feel a part of the community. We are social creatures, and by contributing to not just our smaller groups and communities, but as human beings in this great big world, we add value in some shape or fashion. Carl can't see the big picture, so the philosopher narrows the community down to something simple like school. For some people, a school life isn't going well, and you might be a victim of bullying, or the work is too tough, or you just can't adapt with the teachers or the system itself, aka school sucks. But as the philosopher describes it, it's just a storm in a teacup. School is just a fraction, part of a larger world and community. School may feel like it's your entire life right now, but that's simply not true. I wouldn't consider high school as a highlight of my life, and I felt so much better about myself once leaving it. There's a whole world out there full of other communities that can give you a sense of belonging with people who can make you feel important and encourage you to contribute what you alone can offer. If you're in a relationship, not just love, but any form of connection, any form of relationship, that can be broken down easily because you raised an objection because you said no, then that's a relationship you should probably reconsider and think twice about. Living in fear of one's relationships falling apart is a very unfree way to live, in which one is living for other people. And then we get to the second half of the night, which discusses the importance of horizontal relationships. Our viewpoints are mainly concerned with vertical relationships in which people are either superior or inferior to you. With horizontal relationships, we all see each other as equal, but not the same. And with that kind of thinking, an inferiority complex doesn't emerge. We can all just encourage each other instead of putting each other down and thinking less about where we stand in relation to one another. With the feeling of community, you will also gain this feeling of worth, and that in turn will give you courage. What this entire night leads to is that by having this feeling of being beneficial to the community, you will have the courage to face your life tasks. And the term useful doesn't have to apply to just your skills or abilities, but just your own existence as well. Maybe someone close to you enjoys your company, and that might be a personal comfort only you can provide. Carl disputes by saying that even though he is here, that he is alive, he still doesn't feel like he has any worth. Going back to always being compared to his more successful brother and working at a job where he feels like he could easily be replaced. The philosopher responds by saying there's a choice to choose between having vertical or horizontal relationships. You can't have both because once you have at least one vertical relationship, it becomes a virus and you start to treat all your relationships as vertical. So he wants us to try and adapt looking at people on the same playing field and again, 
Stop treating life as a competition. And that's one step closer to Adler's answer for a happier lifestyle. Finally, we reached the final night. It's been a good month since Carl has visited the philosopher, thinking about the meaning of community, feeling, and his concerns with attachment to self. He believes that no matter what, we always worry about ourselves. We always look at ourselves. He used a business meeting as an example, saying how he feels anxious asking the question in fear of being ridiculed. He thinks the advice having courage isn't enough to tackle this problem. So the philosopher answers this by saying that three things are needed to make the switch from attachment to self to concern for others. Self-acceptance is the first, and this book makes it clear that it's not the same as self-affirmation. Self-affirmation is telling yourself that you can do it, even if it's past your own abilities. And self-acceptance is just accepting yourself, flaws and all. No one is perfect. And instead of focusing on the things you can't change in your life, put attention on the things you can and accept yourself for who you are. And this reminds Carl about a quote he read in a novel called Slaughterhouse Five. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. I heard this somewhere and it wasn't from a scripture or anything, something from a movie. This was also said, I'm thinking Spider-Man 2 or something Aunt May said, it, but I, I'm honestly not sure. I can't remember. All I know is I did hear it from some sort of film media. Anyways, the next step is having confidence in others and the philosopher makes it clear that it is not the same as trust. Trust is based on set conditions while simply believing in the other people is unconditional. Which honestly, you know, it sounds a bit sketchy. Thankfully, the philosopher clarifies that you're not just going to every stranger you meet and putting blind confidence in them, but using confidence as a tool to strengthen your interpersonal relationships. Carl still doesn't see the goal and questions how that would work with a friend. Who's to say that your friends might be taking advantage of you and you're just blindly putting confidence in them? This is where the separation of tasks comes in handy. You are not the one who decides whether you are taken advantage of or not. That is the other person's task. Your task is to choose whether or not to believe this person. And the relationship should reveal itself on how stable it is. And if you're still thinking about the downfalls of completely having confidence in someone, the philosopher would just say that because of your past hurt, you develop this fear of creating confidence in others. And it also depends on the relationship itself. If it's shallow, then the pain will be slight if it falls apart. And if you feel saddened by the outcomes, let yourself be sad. Don't suppress or run away from it because that will just solidify this feeling that you'll always be doubting other people. And that's not the goal here, remember? That's not what we're trying to accomplish. Instead of seeing others as enemies, we should try and see each other as friends. We are given the choice to believe in doubt. And it should be obvious which one we should strive more for. The final step is contribution to others, which shouldn't be confused with self-sacrifice. And Carl calls the philosopher a real hypocrite for this one. He feels like he really got him because to contribute to others, you are in fact serving yourself to others. So where does the difference lie? I'll be honest, the philosopher doesn't provide any concrete evidence to support his stance. And the examples he does give are very subjective to one's own thoughts. You have to have a specific mindset of seeing those around you as comrades. If you see others around you as enemies, the thoughts that will always be running through your mind is, why isn't anyone helping? And why do I feel like I'm the only one willing to help? These are the three steps to have this feeling of community. And Carl comes out and says, what I bet you've all (laughs) been thinking while listening to these principles, what I've been thinking when I first read it. Why me? Alright, why are you picking on me? Why does all the faults fall on my shoulders, our shoulders, and not the other people? Why can't there be any blame for the people who judge me, attack me, and belittle me every chance they get? What you need to remember, and this I agree with, is that whoever's judging you or attacking you, that's their problem, that's their beef, that's their issue. Separating task is probably the best ideal to take away from this book because of how much good it can do for your mind. It's not easy to accomplish though, even the philosopher admits that, which is why I ask that you look it up yourselves for a better understanding because all I'm doing is summarizing it. 
But on this night, we reached the definition of happiness, which is the feeling of contribution. Such a simple answer, but when you apply everything we learned thus far, it begins to make some sense. People seek recognition because they want to like themselves. They want to feel like they have worth and feel like they are of use to someone. But we know now that such a lifestyle isn't ideal because in the long run, you'll be going through your whole life pleasing other people's wishes, therefore restricting you of your freedom. Then Carl goes into the topic of being special, which the philosopher says it's not necessary. It's okay to be normal. And when you're pursuing a life of specialty, you get blinded through life's journey. He relates this to climbing the mountain where your purpose in life sits at the very top of the summit. And instead of enjoying the climb, you are too focused on the top that you can't stop and appreciate all that passes by you. All in all, this entire ending could be summed up as stop and smell the roses every once in a while. Our lives are huge based on our average mortality rate, so you shouldn't be in any rush to get to the top. Enjoy the journey before you, take life by the horns and ride it through. We are not fortune tellers. We can't see what happens in the future, and worrying about it is another blinder to your life. It all may seem scary at first, and that's okay. All you need is a little courage. Not gonna lie, I kinda rushed through that final night only because my voice was dying and it was just summarizing all we have learned and there wasn't really anything you knew you haven't heard before, like living in the moment. But be honest, how often do you hear these life advices? Yeah, yeah, we know it, but our lives get so busy with work, school, and just everyday life they get pushed in the back of our minds. So I hope this talk of ours served as, at least served as a healthy reminder in case they were, they were the farthest thing from your mind. I, uh, I want to say again to not look at this book as having all the answers. There were some portions that were really appealing to me, such as the separation of task and the feeling of community. Since reading this, I've been applying these techniques to my own life for like the past, how long have you been working on this? I, I think two weeks now. And I can honestly see a difference to the way I was living before. I do try to see things in a more positive light and yeah some days it does get really tough as the world just seems to test me with some of my friends and family but I always try to keep an open mind and stay positive because I'm I'm just so tired of being negative man after the year we had I just I just wanted like a fresh start with my mind a restart if you will it's definitely been a big help to me to the way I think and I hope it helps you know I I don't know if these reading rookie episodes will <laughs> ever get past like you know 500 views but I hope that whoever's listening to this if it helps you in some way then I feel like I succeeded but again it doesn't contain all the answers let me put that out there it's just one way of thinking it's just one form of thought and it's very subjective too some portions of the discussions felt sort of contrive just to make the philosopher sound right making the conversations a little biased in my opinion like sometimes the conversation would go on and then carl would be like oh all right i guess and then they move on i was like no i want to hear <laughs> i want i was hoping this would expand a little more but all right i guess the examples were mainly focused on small personal problems so that just tells me that this book was aimed to relieve you of those and nothing too bigger, nothing grand scale. You know, first world problems, if you must. But yeah, I um, I don't know what more I could say aside from checking it out yourself or just Adler psychology in general. Maybe we all get a clearer understanding if we just went to the man himself. But overall, this book was pretty good. And I hope you enjoyed this healing talk. This concludes another episode of The Reading Rookie. I will never stop doing that. <laughs> I just love it so much. All right. Uh, I'm going to go get some water. See you guys next time. Take care.